So welcome, Lucy, tell us about yourself. So I'm Lucy May Constantini and I'm doing a PhD at the Open University that's funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council's Open Oxford Cambridge Doctoral Training Partnership. I'm researching the relationship between practice and textual traditions in the South Indian martial art Kalari Payat, and in particular a lineage called CVN, which is part of Northern Style or Malabar Kalari Payat, so called because it originates in the Malabar region of Northern Kerala. And I train and research at CVN Kalari in Tiruvananthapuram in Trivandrum, which is right in the south of India. And um, I've had a relationship with them since 2002. Tell us firstly, what is Kalari Paya? Am I saying that correctly? And then, yeah. how, <laughs> and then how does it relate to health and healing? So it's Kalari Payat, you said it very well. Um, and it's a martial art that has several different branches. So first of all, there's the physical practice, which you do in the Kalari, which is like a specialized temple for practice. But adjacent to this is the Kalari clinic. And there's a truism at the Kalari that any injury that you sustain during training should be treated and treatable at the Kalari. So this happens, but in practice, the Kalari Clinic is actually just really busy serving members of the general public. And historically, a Kalari Guruka, like the lineage holder, might have been in more remote villages, the only immediately available medical person. So um, Southern style follows a Tamil Siddha medical tradition, but Northern style lineages like CVN uh, have an Ayurvedic medical system and their texts are in Malayalam but they describe it as a specialized branch of Ayurveda. So it has its own particular medicines and like special massage techniques for applying them that are much more specific than you find in like general Ayurvedic practice. Wonderful. So for people that are not so familiar, so there's a Siddha medicine tradition, usually um, textual history, recording it in Tamil in South India. And then the particular set, um, lineage that you're um, studying with, even though it's in the south of India, follows a northern lineage and an Ayurvedic. You would yeah, be saying it's, it's confusing. Yeah, <laughs> so Ayurvedic. It's, it's north of Kerala, not north mm. of India, but it follows. It self-identifies as like a Vedic system. So um, Parashurama is identified as the founder of the system, whereas in Siddha traditions, the sage Agastya, who's a, a southern Siddha sage, would be identified as the founder. So, uh, yeah, so it's very interesting, a very com complex relationship uh, between traditions and place. So how does um, Kalari Paya relate to yoga and Ayurveda as traditions? So its relationship to yoga at this point is pretty speculative. So that becomes a really complicated subject. But um, it does share a similar worldview to traditions like yoga and Ayurveda. And in particular, in CVN's case, that's a Shaiva tantric understanding of the body. Um, so CVN Kalari and Trivandrum brings together traditional Kalari Chikitsa, Kalari medicine, with like the modern Indian requirements for practicing Ayurveda. So both the Gurukal, um, the lineage holder, and his wife come from families whose traditions predate these like post-colonial stamps of authority that you now need to practice. So on his side in Kalari Payat and his wife's family are a long line of Ayurvedic physicians. So all of this comes together in the Kalari, but at the same time, uh, she and now their son both have the Indian BAMS Ayurveda degree, whilst he's trained in the traditional Kalari apprenticeship system. So all of this comes together in the practice in the clinic in the Kalari. Wonderful. So have you had a personal experience using uh, any of these uh, medicines or treatments? Okay, so um, in 2012, I went through um, the apprenticeship, like the Gurukal um, took me through an apprenticeship in Kalari Urichal, which is the massage system. Um, so that's when I first really started to learn about the medicines. But being um, a hypermobile, injury prone dancer, I've given the clinic a lot of work over the years. <laughs> and um, actually, this has really served to deepen my understanding of these medicines, just because I've used them so much. Um, so first of all, there's the application of the body oil and the head oil that you do before you train that's just standard but then when i'm away from the calorie i use various medicines to help manage various conditions and also 
um, yeah, other people sometimes I have like advised certain oils if they've got a sore shoulder or whatever. And so what happens is over time you develop a very um, sensory experience of these medicines and what I was taught is that a culinary physician should bring a certain amount of instinct to the learned understanding of the medicines that the physician uses. And what I understand by this is this instinct is actually like a felt sense, an embodied felt sense that you develop in using them over many years. So that at the culinary, you recognize the medicine. Well, first of all, they make them, but you recognize them through smell, through um, texture, through the color. So it's a very kind of whole, physical experience of what it is to treat and to heal mm, and and very um, tactile i'm sure being yeah. greased up and oiled and and so do they grow their medicines as well locally um so they bring in various ingredients every now and then you'll walk into cut the cutlery for training and there'll be like a pile of herbs or like a huge pile of like bats of oil that have arrived um, and they have a medical facility that they um created I think about 10 years ago, slightly outside of town so that they can now fulfill the various requirements to make the medicines, but they're all made by hand in the traditional way. So yeah, and with the, they don't actually grow um, the, the herbs and there are issues now with sourcing them because of ecological changes, like some of them are becoming much harder to source. Um, and so, and yeah. Is your personal relationship, your assist, like um, your intimacy with the, uh, the guru, is that, uh, necessary before you can even get assessed for something like this the type of um, um not to be a patient so to be a patient you just go to the clinic you get your ticket and you you wait in line that's not difficult but um the guru kalavar kalari has really only trained people who work at the clinic so he he doesn't normally no, you, you can't just go in and decide you want to learn culinary massage from him. I mean, they will, they will send you somewhere else to do it, but they, they won't teach you unless, so you, you have to be initiated into the martial art and you have to be part of the lineage. And even then it's not guaranteed that they'll teach you. Okay, great. So has um, Calorie Payard changed in the context of colonialism or post-colonial modernity? Have you, has that come up in your research? Yeah, no, it definitely has. So by the beginning of the 20th century, it was pretty much extinct because of colonialism and, and other social factors. And it underwent a process of revival similar to that which scholars like Mark Singleton have described in the emergence of modern forms of yoga. And now, like CVN Cullery and Trivandrum, it's essentially a public institution. So it was established in the 1950s under the sponsorship of the Maharaja of Travancore as a re representative of this art form in um, like the newly established capital of the state of Kerala in independent modern India. And so now it falls under the umbrella of the government ministry Ayush. And as such, their traditional medicines, they've either um, obtained licenses for them or in some cases they've adapted them to fit um, permitted yogams, which are recipes which come from Ayurvedic contexts that are allowed. Mm. Have you seen, this is just an a interesting question because we're recording this particular interview during COVID-19, so the worldwide pandemic um, that's affecting uh, people's ability to move because it's such a contagious virus. Has that impacted the calorie at all? Are they changing or are they well, offering services? Yeah, they're in lockdown at the moment. So the calorie itself is shut. I haven't um, yet got details about the clinic. I'm going to find out, but I would be surprised if they were operating because the treatment is tactile. So I suspect under lockdown that is probably not possible. What is, at the moment, uh, one of your um, strongest uh, research questions that you have? Like, what's a driving question that you're asking yourself? Um, well, at the moment, because I'm like buried in the literature review, or maybe not buried enough, um, what I'm really looking at is the relationship of embodied practice across different disciplines in the academy. So how does that speak to and how has that been treated by uh, various disciplines in the academy and how does our like reception of an aesthetic understanding of the body which i think is missing from from yoga studies and from anthropology like how do our aesthetics of what we understand to be movement and what we understand to be um 
like elite movement or acceptable movement, how does that influence our reception of these other forms? So that's, um, that's what's kind of exercising me at the moment, um, simply because I, I think of where I am with the research. Yeah. Um, yeah, longer term, I'm really interested to see if I can uncover a bit more about the, um, like the ritual landscape that the Kalari Payette lives in, because I think that has a lot to say about um, relationships to other kinds of practice and also um, like how these understandings of the body have emerged. Mm. And is, I, have, I do have a question about the relationship to body, um, particularly within the martial arts arena, if you like. It's, is it one where you would say, like I, I notice there's a strong emphasis obviously on health and healing, um, but does the, is the relationship to the body one of uh, overcoming or mastering the body, a bit more like a tapas form, mm -hmm. or is it more um, about developing skills to control an inner energetic body uh, that brings about certain outcomes? Yeah, it's the latter. So they describe it as... Um, well, often they don't describe it. You're supposed to experience it in practice, but it would be described as mastering your vayu and your vayu um, being controlled from a very particular point in the body, which they describe as the nabi mula, which is not the same nabi mula as in yoga. So it's not at the navel, <laughs> it's much lower down. Um, so the idea is that although um, Kalari Payat is, it's very vigorous and it's very demanding on the outer form of the body, but actually that when you really master it, it's supposed to be effortless because it's the value that is taking you through um, the form and also giving you the precision in the form. Where the more kind of tapasya practices come in and, and they don't really exist in that way anymore was that conventionally um, people would train in Kalari Payat as, as part of their kind of education and then particular people would be chosen to be um, champions or soldiers. And then for those people who were then essentially going to be fighting to the death, they would then undergo particular um, like upasanas, they describe it as, which are essentially penances, tapas, um, where they would then be preparing themselves, I think more mentally actually, and probably energetically to encounter those kind of really extreme situations. Mm, yeah, that, that, that sounds very interesting. And so I do have, have that one more question, which is, um, are you able to see uh, through someone who has trained and is skillful in the uh, achieved a certain level of practice are you as a as a researcher able to see this idea of um, manipulating the value or controlling the value having um, it, it, is it sort of a something that you can distinguish in the practitioners themselves from an external uh, viewpoint I mean, to me, it's very clear. I think you need a trained eye. And um, uh, Kalari, uh, in a similar way to yoga, it suffers, if you want to put it in, in that um, context, from like a kind of marketing of the very external forms, like the, the big jumps and the dramatic acrobatics. Um, but actually, even in the people who are doing that, you can see those who have really got the value and those who are kind of just pushing their way through you can see the difference and also in my own practice actually this is where being kind of injury prone and hypermobile has actually really helped because if I force I get injured so I really have to connect to that sense of easefulness in how I practice um, and so this connection between kind of feet and value and movement like they're for me the effortlessness is not effortless <laughs> but working towards the effortlessness is really important because otherwise I'm hurt so, so there's a very clear, um, there's a very clear, um, like payback if I, if I force through. And so, yeah, I see that very clearly in people who practice. Why is this an exciting and important area of further research, given that you're a fairly young scholar coming to um, the area of research and, and um, there's not many people in this particular field. So why do you feel it's an exciting and important area for future research? Um, well, it contributes to a much more complex understanding of Ayurveda than is implied by this received idea of a straightforward lineage of Sanskrit texts. So Kalari Chikitsa self-identifies as Ayurvedic, but it's a specific and local adaptation with a long history in a vernacular language in Malayalam, 
And it also has a really particular relationship to embodied practice. So all of this has quite a lot to say about what we understand Ayurveda to be. And then in the context of yoga, there are geographical and ritual crossovers that haven't been investigated to my knowledge at all yet, um, which potentially have a lot to offer our understanding of all these fields. And how far are you through in your research? Well, how long is a piece of string, really? Um, so I've, I've, I started like formally researching with a Kalari Gurukan in 2012. Like he suggested that we start this project together. But I'm only like six months into the PhD, so. <laughs> and, and because I know you quite personally, I know that you're not only talented as an embodied uh, yogi and dancer, but also uh, linguistically, language-wise. So what, how does the language component of your research come into play? What are you having to um, learn? Uh, what type of uh, material are you working with from a textual perspective? Yeah, so that's challenging. Um, so the, I have some manuscripts which I've got from uh, the ORI, the Orient Oriental Research Institute li Manuscript Library in Trivandrum, the University of Kerala there. Um, those are in Malayalam script and they're mostly in Malayalam, though the initial section of one is in Malayalam script, but in Sanskrit. Um, and then I'm also working with our own, the CVN lineage manuscripts, but only little sections because you, normally they're hidden, they don't share them. But the Gurukal has um, written out, handwritten out sections from those lineage manuscripts for me. So that again is in Malayalam, in Malayalam script. But what is particular about this kind of Malayalam, one, it's old, two, it's really particular. So a general Malayali speaker wouldn't, wouldn't really recognize it. And it also, because it's, it's Malabar Malayalam, it also has elements of Tulu in it. So there's a lot <laughs> going on, yes. Yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a wonderful and fascinating uh, project, and I hope that we get to chat again further down the path and, and see where you're at, not only from the textual perspective, what you've been, managed to uncover, but the, also whether your relationship with the calorie is changing. Um, it would be interesting to see uh, also your perspectives on its... Um, relationship with the current movement in India, which is uh, Ayush, as you've mentioned. So there's a lot of um, effort going into standardizing medicines and so forth on offer. And just recently, actually, I saw that they are also looking for uh, solutions, uh, indigenous solutions to address this um, COVID-19. So it will be interesting to see whether this impacts your research at all. Yeah, sure. Well, so thank, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you very much.